Welcome, everybody, to Awesome Pod Arvada Edition for the week of May 7th. We've got a special treat for you today. Rocky Flats is the big conversation. We had a wonderful time recording with Paul Caroli and a host of others talking all about Rocky Flats. Paul's got a great podcast out there, Changing Denver. He's doing a podcast documentary series on Rocky Flats that he's unveiling over the next six months. We dig into all sorts of topics here. We're going to get you updated on events going on around Arvada, a couple of headlines, and then you're going to be hearing from Paul, as well as Murph Widowfield from the Rocky Flats Cold War Museum. We're also going to hear from a downwinder, and then we're going to end the show with three back-to-back-to-back community profiles. We'll be talking with the Arvada family behind the business Love Belly. It's a prenatal shake. Even their kids crashed a set. We had a really good time with these guys, Eric and Val. And then we talked to Balefire Goods owner Jamie Holier, who's got multiple hats she wears. She'll talk to us a little bit about her jewelry business, as well as some of the tech stuff she does. And last up, we will finish the show with Clark Reeder, one of our fan favorites. He's got a column in the Arvada Press. He's a reporter. Great guy. We're going to be talking about what it's like to live over by Pomona and what it's like to work at a record store when you're a kid. There has been so much going on in Arvada lately. It's awesome to see. First Friday Art Walk was a smash hit last week. Good job to AJ Payne and to Nia over at Vuna and everybody else that was involved with putting that together. If you missed the show, don't worry. There's still artwork up. You can go to Hunter Bay and lots of other places around Old Town and see some phenomenal artwork. I highly recommend it. Big news, awesome pod viewers. You are growing in numbers and people are taking note. It's been cool to get all the great responses from folks that are listening to the show, as well as people that want to sponsor. So we've got some new stuff to announce. Denver Beer Company is going to be coming on as a sponsor. We've mentioned Klein's Beer Hall is on board. Arvada Rent Halls, 5280 Angler. Thank you guys so much for supporting what we do. If you'd like to be part of the awesome pod, support grassroots community-driven journalism. Get in touch, hello at awesomepod.org. We're also announcing today our new show dates. Mark your calendars for Wednesday, May 23rd, and the next Wednesday, June 6th, during the awesome hour between 7 and 8 a.m. at Hunter Bay Coffee Roasters in Old Town, Arvada. Have a suggestion of somebody we ought to get on the show or a topic you want us to cover. Get in touch, hello at awesomepod.org. And remember, on Tuesday, May 8th, it is the Fire Board and Apex Board of Directors elections. And a little sad news, Peyton Garcia, the former Your Hub reporter, is no longer with us. She's going on to be a content editor with Dining Out Magazine. She writes in her goodbye note, I do not believe this is the end of Your Hub, but I do believe Your Hub is in dire need of a community support. So I'm calling on you to find good news in your communities and to continue to submit write-ups, press releases, photos, etc. to our online forum. Events coming up on Tuesday, we've got the Taste of Old Town. You'll go from restaurant to restaurant having a good meal and meeting some community members. And if you look in the sky and you see a drone flying around, don't worry. That's our team. A friend of the show, David Borsma, we've had him on the show before. He's going to be flying his drone out, getting some cool shots for our May 23rd show opener. You're going to want to check that out. Coming up on Saturday, that is a great day to meet a current or former council member. You choose. Dot Miller is going to be doing her Talk and Walk series from Klein's Beer Hall from 3 to 7 p.m. And Mark McGough is going to be leading a hike, meeting at Long Lake at 9 a.m. in the morning. Details about all of this stuff is on the Arvada Visitor Center website. As always, thanks, Gene Gordon, for putting these lists together. Of course, Sunday is Mother's Day. There's a Mother's Day trunk show going on at Balefire Goods in Old Town. You'll be hearing from the store owner later in the show here. A couple of headlines. Arvada Press writes, Teen Mom at Hope House receives vehicle for Mother's Day. This is a cool story. Lake Arbor Automotive and Truck celebrates Mother's Day every year by giving a teen mother a car. I mean, it's Arvada, folks. Let's admit it. We got to have a car to get around, right? Headline 2, Homeless Coalition Files Suit to Stop Sale of 59 Acres. This is the controversial site over at the Federal Center in Lakewood. They've been trying to build a homeless shelter, which got rejected, and now there's a lawsuit. We'll keep track in that story. 
Arvada in the Denver Post once again, y'all. This is a great one. We had a school resource officer on the show a couple of weeks ago, and the Denver Post is highlighting Dana Gerber over at Pomona High. If you want to check that article out, just look in your inbox at your Arvada Insider newsletter. We'll have it there for you. Now, before we jump into the main course talking Rocky Flats, I want to play a little bit from Paul Caroli's podcast, Changing Denver. He's done an amazing job with this thing. He'll be releasing new episodes over the next six months all about Rocky Flats. Here's the trailer. In partnership with the Denver Public Library and the Colorado Independent, Changing Denver presents Unclear Danger, the Colorado story of Rocky Flats. A true story of nuclear weapons, the people who made them, and the things they left behind. I tend to be one who does not believe in conspiracy theory. The activists have devolved into to agitators. Well, he said, we live at this high altitude, got a lot of solar radiation, a little bit more radiation won't really matter. And I stared at him and I said, Tim, think about that. Welcome to our live show, Paul Caroli from Changing Denver. Thank you. Good morning, Russ. Uh, you know, our, we got a podcast brother in, uh, here on the set. We're excited to have you. Uh, and we've got, we've got Murph with the Rocky Flats Cold War Museum. Um, Murph, thank you for uh, joining the show. You're welcome. I'm uh, here. <laughs> uh, we're talking all about Rocky Flats uh, for a little bit here. You guys, if you live in Arvada, you've heard of Rocky Flats. Um, you may not be that educated about what the heck the history is or why it's still in the news um, and some of the issues you know, going on. That's why we have uh, some experts with us here today. Paul, you've got a podcast in Denver. It's kind of taken Denver by storm. Um, it's, uh, it talks all about life in Denver, and you kind of explore different issues. And this series, you've picked Rocky Flats. Yes, that's correct. Uh, the fourth season of Changing Denver, which we started about a month and a half ago, is... Uh, it's like like you hear on Serial, a true crime series. I've taken that formula and applied it to the Rocky Flats story. And uh, the timing is appropriate because this summer the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is opening the Rocky Flats National Wildlife Refuge, which is just a few miles west of where we sit now at the site of the former nuclear weapons plant. We've got some images here uh, we can show you. You guys might, uh, the, uh, the Cold War horse is uh, kind of famous uh, here in Arvada. It's an orange, it's a uh, horse out by kind of commemorating uh, Rocky Flats. Chris, do we have that? So we can pop that on the show. Will you tell us about this uh, horse? Yeah, yeah, I can. Um, it was made by an artist named Jeff Geip, local artist slash activist. Uh, and to my, my understanding is that it was a protest action put up about 10 years ago to remind the community of this tragic aspect of our collective history. And we also have some photos of you uh, reporting. You, you were yep. out uh, reporting. We've got some images of kind of current day where this um, refuge is going to be. So who are we looking at in this photo, the, the fish and wildlife? Yeah, this is the project lead for the Rocky Flats refuge. His name is David Lucas. He's uh, from Kentucky, and now he's been working on Rocky Flats for about 10 years. So he does stuff like manage the wildlife, keep an eye on what animals and plants are out there, make sure it's a healthy space. And, uh, and, and so you, you spent how much time looking into this? Uh, I've been working on this project for about two years. Two years. Yeah, and the photo that you just saw was from uh, about a year and a half ago, shortly after the Fish and Wildlife Service opened up the refuge to limited tours. So after two years of reporting, I'm sure like the pressing question is, you know, that you get all the time is, well, you know, what is it? I mean, the issue here with Rocky Flats is it used to process plutonium parts uh, for the war. Uh, and there were some fires and some environmental contamination. And now we're opening up refuges and we're expanding housing to the area. And the big question is, is it safe? Well, yeah, that is definitely the big question, Russ, and that's what my series is going to answer in part. Um, I, unlike many other journalists who have looked into this issue and seen two equal sides, I have found what I think is an answer. Um, and if you subscribe to Changing Denver, you can hear that in a couple of months. But I think the bigger question is, how do we as a community contend with this legacy? This is, there. it is a tragedy. There was a lot of people that worked there that got sick. It's 
you know, uh, they made nuclear weapons, you know, and that's something that we as a people still don't really have an answer to. We've got, we've got some photos, uh, some black and white photos uh, of the, the plants. Uh, thank you for sending it over some great links. There sure. are some great archives. I mean, the Boulder oh, Library has audio, right, of former workers. Yeah, they have an archive of oral histories. It's more than 100 interviews with former workers, former uh, politicians who worked on uh, oversight bodies, activists who were participating in their way. And what we're seeing here is just uh, some old black and white fi pictures of the site. Murf, you're starting the uh, Rocky Flats Cold War Museum, or trying to. You've been one of the guys trying to get that off the ground. Tell us a little bit about the history of this place. Are you asking for the history of Rocky Flats of, of Rocky or the Flats. history of the at, museum? We're looking at some old uh, photos of Rocky Flats right now. Uh, people wearing gloves and glove boxes. What happened there? Well, by golly, I have to tell you that you don't have enough time for me to sit here and tell you all about it. There is so much history there that it's absolutely amazing. Um, basically, uh, it was started in 1951. Uh, they did a lot of searching and determining where to put the plant, but someone somewhere had to build the trigger mechanisms, which is the center device in the nuclear weapon that actually causes it to become a, a thermonuclear bomb or whatever. And that's what they made out at Rocky Flats, was the, uh, what, what they call the trigger or the core or the central part of it. Uh, there was no bombs made out at Rocky Flats. Everything was shipped down to Pantex in Texas for final assembly, whether it was done for um, submarine missiles or bombs or whatever it was done for. But Rocky Flats was the core. It was the, the central part and the most important part of the uh, bomb or the missile. Um, it was. It, it did. And, and how many workers? Well, how many? When, when we talk about workers that might have been impacted by health issues at the plant, there were several big fires that you know certainly released some bad things into the air. Uh, and the big issue is just is the main issue is the workers that were there during these incidents, but also the people that lived in the surrounding area. How many people are we talking about when we talk about the workers? Well, when you're talking about a forty, some odd year span, there were over fifty thousand workers totally. Now, not all at one time. Most of the time, there was uh, approximately two to 3,000 workers. In the later years, there was uh, approximately eight to 10,000 workers. Um, and Paul, of all the things that you could have picked, you know, your, your podcast is Denver, right? So yeah. you, you can really kind of pick anything. Uh, why Rocky Flats? Why did this intrigue you so much? Well, as a journalist, and that's what I do by trade, I have written for a long time about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And so when I moved here uh, several years ago, I started this project and I f was looking at physical spaces and people's relationship to them. And I came across this issue by chance. And initially I, you know, I sort of saw the outlines of what I was very familiar with, with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And that's a single place that has become the focus of many, many people's identity. And on all sides, like there's people that hate it just on principle for the fact that it was part of the nuclear weapons industrial contact, con... Plex. Plex. Complex. Thank you, Russ. And there are people who are enormously proud of the time they spent working patriotically for the defense of our country. And I thought, you know, there's, there's more to it here. There's a real story here. And so you, uh, we talked earlier, uh, you drew that comparison of kind of studying the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, and you were telling me you kind of came in uh, mm -hmm. and were expecting one experience and had a little different while you were reporting. Tell me about that. Yeah, well, uh, my background in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is mostly on the Palestinian side of things. I write for the Journal of Palestine Studies. So I have a natural affinity for the activist groups in that conflict. You know, I, I the tend to think that they're persuasive. And yeah, in this case, that's, that's where my instincts took me, was to explore the activist side of things first. Uh, so I talked to the leaders of uh, the Candela's Glows, Rocky Flood's Right to Know. I talked to Leroy Moore of the Rocky Mountain Peace and Justice Center. And I thought collectively they put forward a pretty persuasive case. 
But then you go over and you talk to the other side, and, well, that's pretty persuasive, too. And is the other side what? Government data? Yeah. Well, the other side is also multi-part. There's and we're the, talking about specifically the issue is, is it safe, right? That's the, that's the whole issue? Uh, yeah, that's definitely one big part of it now. Uh, so the Fish and Wildlife Service is in control of the refuge, which is the buffer zone around the site of the actual plant. The Department of Energy is in control of the site. And then the chief regulators on the site are the Environmental Protection Agency and the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Gotcha. And so the gover all the government entities are on, this, on the same page. This is safe. We want to open a refuge. And then we've got the Jefferson Parkway also, right? Yeah, Jefferson County has for a long time wanted to build a, a parkway through the refuge lands. And it would kind of close the loop of the highway around Denver. And so that's, that's one other controversial aspect of this. That's something that the activists focus on. They want it to stop, essentially. Speaking of the other side of the uh, government entities involved, Department of Energy, uh, Murph, I know that you for years have been working to open up a Rocky Flats Cold War Museum, um, and you haven't felt like the Department of Energy has been fully supportive. Is that, is that accurate? Uh, somewhat accurate. I wouldn't say that they haven't been fully supported. That's they've only actually, answer, somewhat accurate. They've actually <laughs> been against us. <laughs> they've been, they, fought, they have, have they fought against you? Tell me about it. Well, uh, we, we have had, uh, for instance, we had a, uh, congressional grant, uh, to get the museum started. And, uh, but the congressional grant came through the Department of Energy. And Department of Energy uh, told us, for instance, that we could not use it to advance the museum. We had to use it to provide only. And so, therefore, we couldn't use the money to help us raise the money to build a building. And it wasn't near you enough to build a building. Some, some bureaucratic red tape jiu-jitsu. Yes, we did. And, okay. it's, and it's been a mess. Paul, what do you think about that? I mean, do you, do you feel like this museum should exist? Uh, yeah, I think it's a shame. I would love for this to be, uh, you know, in actuality. I think it would be appropriate for Col uh, History Colorado to incorporate it. I would think it would be appropriate for the Fish and Wildlife Service to incorporate it into the visitor center that they're planning. Guys, can you imagine the tourism appeal of a Rocky Flats Museum, right? Absolutely. And we have the backing of all of those entities, but none of them have the money that they can hand us to build the museum. All right, Jefferson so if we got any County, slick lobbyists Boulder out County. there that know how to deal with these federal bureaucrats, get in touch with us at the Awesome Pod. Maybe we'll get you a free T-shirt. Guys, we would love to have you back on. We would love to get you on the podcast and talk more about this. But, guys, lucky for you, you can hear them on the Changing Denver podcast. How do people go over to that? Uh, you can find the podcast at www.changingdenver.com or the Apple Podcast directory and any other place where good podcasts can be found. And in this week's Awesome Pod podcast, we played a little teaser clip. Um, so check that out. We'll play another teaser clip on Monday. Um, so just check out the Awesome Pod podcast if you want a teaser of Paul's podcast. We're getting a little meta. I think we're going to yep. go to a video. All right. Hey, Awesome Pod viewers. Uh, welcome back. It's Katie, and I'm really excited here to be talking to Elizabeth Panzer. Thank you so much for coming on. No problem. I know you're here representing the Downwinders, and, you know, it's for all of us that are not from Colorado or not from this area, it's really important that we come here and talk to people like you and talk to Murph Whittlefield from the Cold War Museum and see Paul's um, documentary, our podcast series, because we just we want to know what's going on, right? Right. So how did you get, um, you know, you're a part of the Down members group, uh, Downwinders group. Can you tell me how you got started or how you got affiliated with that group, and then what is the Downwinders organization? Um. I am from here, but I moved away after college. So when we moved back, um, we ended up moving into the area. It was the first development that had been built in a long time. Um, it's five parks, 86 in Indiana. So uh, I hadn't, I'd never researched the issue of Rocky Flats. I grew up here. It just was in the background. I thought it was political. Right. So how I got involved was my son actually developed a very rare form of can heart cancer, a very aggressive, at the same time a neighbor did. Um, we both lived there for 10 years, um, very outdoor people. And so uh, it was kind of a wake-up call, like, um, what's going on? Right. So that piqued your interest. And so the Downwinders have a, um, on the website, which is great, it, what is a Downwinder, you know, and it's mm -hmm. that, area, that geographical area. But the organization itself, you know, what are the issues today that, you are, that the Rocky Flats Downwinders are educating on or trying to connect with the community about? What's the main concern? 
First of all, it's we're not a political organization. We're interested in health. Um, what the boundary? It's a loosely organized group that was created in 2014 um, of people who either live or have lived near this Rocky Flats weapons production former plant, um, and we're interested in advocating for more studies, health studies. Uh, this whole area, the the long-term effects of living near plutonium or other contaminants have not they've been undocumented and uninvestigated well you know what the thing that's what we do awesome pod for is the thing we do, we do it is to bring all of that stuff you find when a google shirts together here we ask questions and we try to get our community connected to go out and get informed and educated yourself hey guys uh welcome we're over on set two here with val val welcome to the set hello everybody and uh, we are live TV. We got a live TV appearance with your husband, Eric. Hi, <laughs> Eric and Val. You guys are regulars uh, at Hunter Bay. Uh, I I see. This is like your office. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> we're uh, good friends with AJ, and yeah, we're pretty well known around here. <laughs> and tell us what what do we see you working so hard on? What's what's in front of us here? What are we working on? Well, um, we are we have a product, and it is Love Belly. It is a complete prenatal nutrition shake. And so it's basically like if you were to take like a power-packed protein powder and a prenatal vitamin, and if they had a baby, this would be it. <laughs> if they had a baby, and, and you've brought uh, some demos here, you know, so some, some visuals. This is the best-looking set we've had on the Awesome Pod. Thank you, guys. Sweet. Nice Yay. work. What are we looking at? Eric? Uh, so what we're looking at here is basically just the product has been formulated to be either a standalone product, so you can just mix it up from – Put it in the powder, put it in a shaker, shake it up, or you can throw it in a blender, put some greens in there, put some fruit in there. But really what it's designed is it is designed, not only a prenatal vitamin, but it's designed to have greens, vegetables. We have our green blend. So it's basically anything that you can find at the grocery store, really to pass that OBGYN test, and also any fruits that you find at the grocery store as well. And, uh, and so you've got kind of the vitamins here. About this is what we're replacing. We no longer need all these plastic bottles. Yeah. I mean, if you want to know a little bit about my story and the reason why we even came up with this is that, you know, my first pregnancy was awesome. I felt amazing. You know, I was like strutting around in my high heels and going to like my birthing class and all the other mamas were like, I just want to punch that lady. You were, you, know? you were the mom that everybody hates. Okay. Yes, exactly. First. First pregnancy, but then second pregnancy, not so much. I was like, we had moved to Costa Rica to a small little surfing village, and, um, you know, I was hot. I was, like, sweating all the time, and my ankles are, like, swollen so much it looked like a hippopotamus. <laughs> and I just was like, ugh, I felt just, you know, crappy. <laughs> and, you know, I'd walk by the open-air markets and, like, the smells of like fish and over like overly ripe fruit and stuff like that would just make me nauseous. And so I was like, you know, I wanted to be able to have something, you know, that worked for me. I think I think a lot of moms out there listening right now are, are thinking, yeah, that that all sounds familiar. Yeah, you know, and I I got to the point where I was like, I just want something that's going to cover all the bases because from my first pregnancy, which was awesome, and then my second pregnancy, which was not so awesome, you know, I still wanted the same thing. I wanted that, like, nutritional assurance that I was getting everything that I needed, and there just wasn't anything like that out there. And so I'm like, well, let's just create it. So we worked with OBGYNs, nutritionists, naturopaths, and we formulated what is now Love Belly Shake. And and for folks that and, – and we got the kid. We got the kids on set. Who, who do we got here? What's your name? Brody. We got Brody and? Bree. And Brody and Bree. We got the whole family out here, guys. Hunter Bay, it's where community meets. A uh, young couple making it happen. It hasn't been released yet. Tell us the details. Yes. Um, we are off to manufacturing, so it's been about three and a half years. And here's also one of the uh, main reasons it was developed. And, you were um, in mommy's belly making her miserable. <laughs> no. But, no, so, yeah, so it's off to manufacturing, and it's um, about uh, six to eight weeks. We should have it probably around June, so it's pretty exciting. And uh, it, is it a little akin, is having your own business a little akin to giving birth? Uh, yeah, it's our, it's our third child. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is the truth. Sure. Eric, we got to talk just real quick, uh, Hunter Bay uh, coffee. You guys hang out here all the time. Pretty cool place. Oh, totally. We use this pretty much as our 
office. I mean, I like to kind of bounce around from in between the house to different places, and I've had offices before, and when I get stuck in them, I get really bored, really antsy. It's just great. So They're like family. Yep. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for coming out to the Awesome Pod. Yeah, thanks for having me. And we're going to roll a little tape. We're going we're gonna to head right over to our next set where we're going to be talking to Bale Fire Goods, another power woman business owner here in Arvada. So much going on in Arvada, right, Jamie? Indeed. Always. <laughs> Good morning. You know, I'm uh, Jamie, part of Bale Fire Goods. Um, you know, you do, of course, everyone thinks it's just jewelry. I mean, I do when I walk by and saw the outside of the store and the display, but you actually, you have a really interesting path of how you got to having a great store on Grandview and the jewelry work you do. You do a little bit of tech, a little bit of digital literacy. Can you tell everybody about your, some of the things about yourself? Um, yeah, so in addition to owning Bellfire Goods, I also have two tech companies. Um, one of them does custom software and one does digital, um, uh, like digital project consulting and wow. project management. And then the digital literacy thing? Um, so I've done those with one of my tech uh, projects, one of my tech clients, we worked on that. And then before that, I actually worked for the Department of Ed um, and did some work for that at the state level. Wow. Awesome. Amazing. Okay, so let's talk about the store. Okay. When did it open? What's inside? I mean, we have some pictures right now of the amazing jewelry and everyone out there that's got a parent, a father, a parent figure in their life, um, anybody, because I know Mother's Day is coming up, um, you can go shopping by looking at these photos <laughs> right now. So let's roll some footage on those photos and talk about Bellfire. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So we opened in November um, and we have a collection of artisan jewelry, both local and international. And our international um, we're the only store in the U.S. to carry many of them. Wow. Um, and then we also have some modern craft goods, so some ceramics, some woodwork. And then we also have uh, local art every month that's from a different artist. Um, okay, rose gold. I want that rose gold <laughs> necklace. Yeah. Um, you, you said it can be etched or what? Um, yeah, so that's actually uh, from New Zealand. It's alluvial rose gold, so it's completely... It's Is it a special rose gold? Um, it's it's mined from, uh, pulled out of the sand in an alluvial um, area in New Zealand, so it's completely environmentally friendly the way they pull it out. I must have it. Yeah. And then it's hand engraved. The designs on it are hand engraved. Oh my gosh. All right. I think I know exactly where to send Rich um, for my Mother's Day presents this year. But you know, one of the best things about our community is that we also support not just um, the professional art and mm -hmm. art across the country but, and the world, but local art. So the art walk's coming up on May 4th Right. Yeah. for student art. And we're going to have uh, a bunch of different high school students' art. I'm really excited. i got to go pick out the pieces we're going to have in our shop. You get to pick them? Yeah. Oh. So all the different shop owners went, and they chose which pieces they wanted to, to have in their store. And are you really excited? There's some uh, students made this. Yes, yes. In our public school. Yep. all across Jeffco. So yep. uh, were you impressed? I am, yeah. I think there's some really interesting pieces. In fact, some of them just reminded me of some professional artists. So really? I think we have some really good stuff. Hey, Jeffco Schools, I think that's a huge compliment to our art teachers and all of our professionals in our schools every single day. Well, Jamie, thank you so much for being a part of the Old Town community here. I will see you. Yes. Pull out some stuff for me to take a look <laughs> at so we can do some wish list shopping. Trunk okay. show? Yeah, we're doing a May Mother's 12th. Day trunk show the Saturday before Mother's Day with four Colorado metalsmiths and free mimosas and uh, free chocolates. Free so. mimosas and chocolates at Bellfire? <laughs> Hello. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for everything you do in the Arvada community. Um, we are getting ready to wrap it up, and we're going to roll right into getting done with these days. Yeah, Chris? Welcome back, everybody, to Awesome Pod Arvada Edition. We are closing out show two with Clark Reeder from the Arvada Press. Hey, buddy. Good to be back. Welcome back. <laughs> Hey, things have, have, have grown since you've been Yes, I love the backdrop. It's we, great. <laughs> and, uh, you know, lots of people had live music. Yes, we, always you know, good. You know, we did that for you, Clark. We knew that you're a music guy. You've got a, a music column in the Arvada of Press. We want to impress you. Oh, well, you guys succeeded, so bravo. <laughs> Tell me about what you're working on. You're all, the, the cool thing about journalists is you're always out there in the community listening, talking to people, and working on right. things, trying to, you know, write things that are part of the dialogue. So what are you working on? Well, it's with getting the warmer weather so er, and live music. We're getting ready for summer concert series yes. all over. Our Vada yeah. Center just announced theirs. We're seeing places Lakewood, Castle Rock, um, everywhere. It's going to be live music outdoors. So that's what I've been working on, or a roundup of do what you, you can see this summer. Do you ha yeah, do you have any insider tips for us on things we should be looking out for? Well, the Arvada Center announced their lineup not even a week ago. It's a great list. You're going to have 80s stuff like Pat Benatar. They've got bluegrass, like the Waylon Jennies, um, some great country stuff, and classical. There's, they always do Mozart under the moonlight, stuff like that. I didn't hear any hip-hop. Uh, <laughs> I guess that's a good guess. No hip-hop. 
Yeah, not at, so much in Arvada. They yeah. do more. Any um, any uh, electronic music? Anything that the young kids might like? Um, because you know we're be... live on right. Facebook and <laughs> yeah. we're podcast. You know, so we're talking to young people here. Well, that for that stuff, Red Rocks is going to be where you're going to want to go. They're having a really dynamic lineup this year. I'm seeing more techno and electronic music than ever before at Red Rocks. So there will be some great stuff up there. Well, uh, you know, Clark, uh, tell us a little bit about you, you know, the, the person, the guy in the community. <laughs> um, I grew up in the Wheat Ridge, Arvada area. My mom owned Budget CDs, uh, the record store in West or Wheat Ridge for 25-odd years. And then I worked there for about five years after when it was Angelo's before they closed that location down. So I really grew up in the music area. So your mom this. owned a CD store <laughs> back when such a thing right, existed, exactly. and then you worked in the CD store. Yeah, yeah. And so that's kind of akin to like the movie High Fidelity. Yeah, you know that exactly. was your that, that was, was your sort record of store. Yeah, that and Empire Records were sort of the jokes we always made among staff. So, and what yeah. kind of music did you grow up with? Um, a lot of classic rock. My mom was a big fan of James Taylor, Jackson Brown, Springsteen, and my dad like. And he's Led Zeppelin. But my dad oh. was the Zeppelin, the Who, the oh, Allman man. Brothers. Exactly. Right so on. there you go. And and where do you live? I live uh, right behind Pomona High School. See, guys, he lives <laughs> in Arvada. Your Arvada press reporter lives in Arvada. That's awesome. Yeah. What's it like over there? It's great. It's a great community. You can hear, especially this time of year, you can hear the baseball games from my house and stuff like that. You get all the kids coming through. So it's a really nice little area right there. All right, so if I'm going to open up my Arvada Press in the next few weeks, I'm going to see stuff about uh, summer concert series. What else? Um, we'll be talking about some of the outdoor film concert series. Arvada does theirs a little later in the year. Red Rocks announced their film on the rocks, which is always super popular. They're going to be doing stuff like Black Panther and Last Jedi and 80s stuff. So we'll have that coming. Um, Book Fest at Arvada is also a big deal. They'll be doing Book that. Book Fest. Yeah. When is that coming? That is May, I want to say, 19th, I believe. If you know a cool, young artist, up and coming, they don't have to be young. I'm just assume, making some assumptions <laughs> here um, that would be good to play on the show. Uh, let us know. Hit us up on the comments section. Email us at info yeah. at awesomepod.org. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you guys so much. Have an awesome week.